very early age, I had access to tech and computers. And so at an early age, I had to make really big decisions that helped me expand my risk-taking behavior, which is a huge part of being an entrepreneur. And Nancy Drew is one of my role models. I love mysteries, I love solving problems, and I love like detective work. Yes. And I know where it comes from, why I became this inquisitive character and curious and using data and information to solve things, because I always feel like you're uncovering and finding and it's exciting and there's always a mystery to be solved when you get data or information, which is what I love doing. I always balanced my life with um, activity, physical activity to mm -hmm. help with like managing stress and managing just your health, paper route. And uh, that's, you had to increase your own sales on the paper route. College, I went to Frito-Lay and drove a truck. Uh -huh. So the 24 foot trucks with the chips on the side. Okay. So. With that, that's how I entered into marketing. I was balancing now school and work. So I'd say I started working when I was 11 and I have never stopped. Went into more science-based products with GSK and GSK moved me to the US. Now, where did they move you? I moved to Pittsburgh. The senior brand manager running the biggest business um, in Canada, which was the Sensodyne brand. When I was in my early 20s, the thinking was training and development was like the most important thing. Yeah. And how can I get the best marketing training possible? Businesses based on looking at data. I have a track record of having done it on big, big businesses. The things we had to do was look for new flavors. It's kind of funny, but at Frito-Lay, we'd all sit around in a table and say, okay, well, what would be the next biggest flavor? For me, building a business was around how do you build the brand equity? And we started there. So I became the VP on the Walmart account. Um, at uh, another company, and then I was heading up all of sales strategy at RB4, the healthcare Mucinex brand. Stayed in my corporate job, I wasn't gonna feel like I really made the difference that I wanted to make. Okay. And it was kind of an inner passion and burning I'd always had, and yeah. I was also faced with, every time I looked at leaders at that point, which was five years ago, how many CEOs were women? GSK, because the value is like, it's do more, feel better, live longer. I still remember it. Uh -huh. and, uh, and it really resonates within the company. And when I moved to other companies and corporations, yeah. the values were not ingrained in the company. Chief, like a really successful career and great financial success, I should start my own business. That I could do it yeah. and that I had enough experience. Like, I'm ready. Moved to the New York area that I wanted to work for myself. So I had to start ideating on what that was. To analyze a lot of industries in my corporate job. That was like, you'd quickly look at it, you'd be looking at P&Ls, you'd be looking at industry financials, um, the craft alcohol space, Uh huh. and then started to dissect it. And in particular, beer was growing at 13%. Yeah, so you saw a signal in the data. Yes. So for craft beer made sense from a product standpoint because of the margins. So did you build this automatic pouring machine? We actually did. You we did. actually did. Cool. Yeah, we did. And it's in my basement now in the I graveyard. Time to pivot. That don't have readily access to data or they don't know how to use their data and, and match it to other information, blind spots in your business. And that if you took information that you had, you would make better decisions. The concept was if we provided information that businesses would make better business decisions. Let's look for correlations that would indicate that they would drive sales. New brand, uh, and then Brewasis launched a new site. At the time we knew we wanted a parent company as well that didn't just provide alcohol industry, but also other industries such as CBD and cannabis. Time, we needed to go, and you need to test, you need to build a prototype. Insights based on what they saw on their social media, so versus their competitors, and it's the first time that we're taking social media and they were seeing their market share versus competitors. Following other craft breweries on social media to then be able to find out what their competitors are doing and where they are. Uh -huh. And then penetrating those markets as well. Dark data, so this is where I got into where I am now. What's uh, now? So dark what, data, okay. What's that, what's that? And I love this. So, cause I was all about my, if you go all the way back to Nancy Drew, I'm all about yeah. like, look at information no one's gonna look at. I would go back into the tables of research reports. Somebody's gonna give you a research report, but the data tables are have everything, and people don't look at those, because mm. it's just too much information as a brand manager. But those are the areas where you'd ask questions and dig deeper into your consumer. Look at data, you're looking at areas where 
there's untapped growth or you're not using the data to drive growth and that's the concept of dark data. So it's non-traditional data. Okay, so nothing data. to do with the dark web. Not dark web. Got it. It's types of data that aren't being used for a specific purpose. So it's hidden yeah. almost, like blind spot. And that's what a lot of the stuff I do now is having your own brewery. Right. Here's what we'd recommend, or here are the breweries we'd recommend you should work with. Editors, so we do a deep dive into the whole space for a full year by quarter and then by month to understand what are the things that are big themes and trends, ingredients that are coming up, what's the next thing that should be popping up for um, flavors that you should be looking at. We take everything that we do with the highest realm of integrity. You can raise 500,000 um, and in a convertible note, multiple things and you're supposed to only work on funding when you're working on it and I don't know how any other Founder does that, but if anyone has as any as opposed tips, to actually as opposed to actually running the business, running the business. Yeah, full development of our beta. So we're in a alpha test right now. Social media data, which is your Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, um, and YouTube. We look at web analytics. We look at the sales data, and then we layer it onto other pieces of information. Uh huh. And then industry data, other areas like cannabis and CBD. That's kind of a new space that we're looking at. Big data companies, but there's no one who's capturing the smaller brands. Always looking for people to join our team. So the values of my company, which are around diversity, curiosity, insight, solutions, integrity, and I'll survive. Trust me, I've survived this long yeah. under, and I'm I'm still surviving. Yeah. The importance of a team and building a really strong uh, culture. But disciplining your data, I which we, it's a huge spin on like, kind of being funny on, you know, we're cracking the whip on your data. It might be like unruly and it's hiding out and you don't know where it is and we're gonna rally it all together. Welcome to Startup Hunter, also streaming on YouTube. I'm here with Sharon Joseph, the CEO and founder of Brew Asis, which is disciplining your data. Now, on this show, we go all the way back. And before we even get into your day to day at Brew Asis, Sharon, I want to know where were you born and also I want to know what your parents did as far as business. Sure. Uh, so I was born in Ottawa, Ontario. Yes. So I'm Canadian. So you'll probably hear that in my um, accent with the out and about. Uh, and my family. So my mom was raising three kids and my dad was in tech. Yeah. Now, was he yeah. an entrepreneur or did he work for somebody? My, my family is first generation immigrants to Canada. So they came from South America, from a country called Guyana. Um, and my grandmother and, um, immigrated all her kids and they went to college and went into tech. And no one, no one in my family really started entrepreneurialism before my grandmother. My grandmother opened up a few things. So she started in Guyana actually with like these um, icy pops. Yeah. So, and she would just sell them. And, um, and then in Canada, she tried to start her own restaurant, like a pizza shop downtown Ottawa. Uh-huh. Um, but then the family was eating all the food. Right. So it became more expensive. I think that was the gist of her saying that she had to close it. Uh-huh. So, um, my dad did not become an entrepreneur, but he went in and studied, um, how to configure computers. And so from a very, very early age, I had access to tech and computers. Right now we're talking like um, IBM computers and- Yeah. So think, um, if you think back to what networking was like in uh, the 80s, uh, there's something called the NABU network. Okay. Tell me, I've never heard, tell me about this. I've never heard about it. Yeah. So you would actually, um, they would turn on the network at a specific time and turn it off at a specific time. So you were regulated by when they turned on and off the network. Uh huh. So um, in those days, it, you know, you had some games. Um, I barely even remember, but I played things like Load Runner. Oh, I remember Load Runner. Castle Wolfenstein. Of course, I okay. played that. Great. So these were kind of the things that would be on the network. My brothers were always into uh, the games as well, a lot more than I was actually. My brother's into computer animation. He's working on um, in the, he's been working in the gaming industry. So that's how I started in kind of my tech adventure and things that would be solutions for other people through computers. So here's where I want to go next. Yeah. What was the first hustle that you can remember you doing? Sure. Were you, you know, five years old selling brownies or 
something like that. It didn't <laughs> even have to be selling something. It's just like a hustle in any form. Yeah, so the first thing, a couple things about me. So one, I was always an innovator. So when they asked for us to bring something into show and tell at school, yes. I brought in my cat. <laughs> That's so, a bit different. Yeah, so I put it on a leash, <laughs> brought it on the school bus, and I would bring it, I would brought it into school. And then other things I do, so we had to do a documentary on a school project, and mine was on France. And I remember recording a fashion show. I used my brothers actually as models. Uh huh. And uh, I record, yeah, <laughs> I wish I had that still. Uh huh. It could be good blackmail. Um, but like I was always an innovator, so I thought outside the box. So I got them to dress up in dresses. I would go outside and like videotape cows and speak French. And videotape cows? Yeah, because I mean, France, you're thinking cheese and you're pretending you're on the farm. Uh huh. So got I mean, it. I lived in Canada, so we had far access to farms. So these are the little things I would do. Um, and then I was all I didn't sleep a lot as a kid or any time actually in my life. So I, on average, sleep about six hours. So I had more what? hours in the day than most people. No, so, so you're one of those people. Yeah. Um, and do you feel full? I'm just so, sorry to make a tangent, but do you feel fully rested at six hours? I do. And wow. I, yeah. The only thing I'd say is I'm physically active, and my body should get more rest for the amount of physically physical activity I do. Yeah. So with hard training, you need eight hours of sleep ah. for your body to recover, and that's the only place I'd say I feel it and for me like a good solid workout is like a three hour bike ride or like a five hour hike or you know doing a couple hours in a day of a workout so that's the only thing I, I usually feel rested on six hours wow I'm an eight hour guy yeah um, I know I've heard of you people <laughs> <laughs> uh, so so we got sidetracked so so you made this documentary fashion video yeah. And so that was, that's an amazing hustle. What, now, was this on like a VHS camcorder? Yeah, it was the little, it was the VHS camcorder. I, I love also it. did things like, you know, when it came to science fair, I always did tech or, or digital things, or I was trying to solve some sort of problem or figure out the differences between people, like gender and how they reacted to certain things. So I was a science fair winner on a couple of things that my dad um, and I built. and. I think what I really learned at a young age, uh, my mom actually, was, she actually was kind of out of our lives by the age of four. And so I had to grow up pretty quick and I, I was forced to make big decisions. So one of the biggest decisions You were I the made, older sister? I'm the oldest right. of three. And so my dad would you know, be like, okay, well we have this option. We can stay in Ottawa, Ontario. We can move to Toronto or we can move to, um, Vancouver, and that was with a company called Computerland SHL Innovations at the time. And so I remember him consulting me and asking me what I thought. And so at an early age, I had to make really big decisions that helped me expand my risk-taking behavior, which is a huge part of being an entrepreneur. Yeah. Um, wow. I'm, I'm just really being empathetic right now. And uh, so... What I want to ask next is, um, so you moved. Yeah, so you we moved. You moved to? We moved from Ottawa, which, I mean, amazing city. I was young. I had, you know, I'd moved to school. So another thing that I learned um, to do a lot was move because with my dad having, you know, three young kids, um, you know, his wife being sick, we moved in with my grandmother for a bit and then we moved out again. And so I probably estimated or calculated that I moved every two years of my life. Yeah. Which meant moving school. So you had to make friends really, really easily. So you had to be super adaptable and super flexible. And this was with your dad. He would get a job somewhere different every time. He would stay at the same job. He actually stayed at the same job. But given circumstances, when you have three kids, you have to figure out who's going to get them to school and back uh -huh. and who's going to be taking care of them when you're at work. Yeah. So without a mom or a you know, mother head in the equation, you had to improvise, which we actually moved in with my grandmother and some of my aunts. Yeah. So I was really fortunate because then I learned from these other women that were then in their late teens um, and they were reading things like Nancy Drew. Uh-huh. So uh, my aunt told me, I'm, Aunt Nancy Drew is one of my role models. I love mysteries. I love solving problems. And I love like detective work. Yes. And I know where it comes from. 
And so she, it was her book collection that was there at my grandmother's and I read them all. Uh huh. So this was another part of like why I became this inquisitive character and curious and using data and information to solve things because I always feel like you're uncovering and finding and it's exciting and there's always a mystery to be solved when you get data or information, which is what I love doing. So we have a real life Nancy Drew <laughs> in the flesh. Um, so let's get uh, chronologically maybe to high school. Um, were you still winning science fairs in high school? Yeah, so actually when we moved from Ottawa to Toronto, uh, we had an interim stint in Burlington. So again, I'm moving schools again in Vermont. elementary school. No, Burlington. Um, oh yeah, I haven't even made it to the US yet. Yeah. Um, in Canada. Oh, Burlington, Canada. Yeah, so we actually had, we're fortunate enough, I again moved to a bunch of schools and um, I started to win awards in French uh -huh. because Ottawa, you're bilingual by the time you're in, entering into high school. Sure, I went to school in McGill. Okay, oh, did you? Yeah. Oh, are you Canadian? No. Oh, okay, but awesome. So I've been to McGill, obviously. Um, we did case competitions. So. I then um, was just academically, I spent a lot of time studying and I spent a lot of time with our teachers and um, doing extra projects and things like that because I was always interested in what else could I do um, with the spare time when people were like hanging out in the playground. Uh -huh. That really I'm... wasn't that exciting to me. So that was my thing. I, I was always one of those uh, kids that had like ants in my pants and I always wanted to be busy. I wanted to be learning. I read a lot of books. I remember when you had those competitions and you had to see how many books you could read. I always wanted to be one of the top students. Um, and then just like things that were extracurricular things you could do at the school. So we had prefect club and a perfect, uh, sorry, a breakfast club where we helped feed kids from elementary other schools as I was entering in high school. Social entrepreneurship. Yes. And then I also was, um, I joined the swimming team and so I always balanced my life with um, activity, physical activity to mm -hmm. help with like managing stress and managing just your health. So at an early age, one of my best friends, um, her mom and her started taking me as part of their family on their family pass to the gym. Yeah. I was like 15 and we started hitting the gym. So weights, cardio, it's just like something I've always done. Uh huh. And then for, throughout high school, it was literally- Here's a curveball for you. When's the first time you remember selling something for money and try, oh. trying to sell something? Um, well, when I was 11, we did do, so selling something for money. I definitely didn't try, we did sticker collecting and stuff. Uh -huh. And uh, so I wouldn't sell them though, but I would trade. So I wasn't about necessarily like, hey, I want to get money from it, but I was like, how can everybody benefit from this? So I would trade stickers and then we, we would trade cards. Um, and then the paper route would have been the first time that I had to do some hard selling. Now, you were a salesperson on the paper route. Well, I was, I was probably 11 when I started a flyer route. And then after that went to a paper route and uh, that's, you had to increase your own sales on the paper route. You'd obviously have clients and customers, and this was in um, Toronto, but you were responsible for picking up other people. Were you delivering the papers and? Uh, yes. So you're like a micro entrepreneur right there because you're both doing the distribution, but also the sales. Yeah, and I knew that if I wanted to get something or save for something that I needed to have my own uh, dollars to do it. So what was the first thing you remember buying with your hard earned money? Oh boy. Um, I know I got a bike. Ooh, uh, that's yeah. pretty significant. Yeah, I know I did buy it, that we, you know, invested in a bike. And then I'd say it would have been things like just funny enough, like clothing and books. So, and then coming out of the paper route, I did work my first job. And I remember this one at Arby's, which is still around. Sure. Yeah. Hamburgers. Uh, roast beef. Roast beef. Yes. Roast beef. And I was I was promoted to a crew trainer. Yeah. At that point. At how old? I was 15. You're 15 already uh, um, in leadership. So yeah, I was Well, I would have started and then worked for about a year. And then we had these crew trainer positions. So it was like a good opportunity to take 
what I'd learn and then train other people, but also I was balancing now school and work. So I'd say I started working when I was 11 and I have never stopped. Right. That was a key thing that I reflected on that there's never, had never been a point where I didn't take a break and say, hey, let me think about working on my own company until I became an entrepreneur. And, and now I want to get to this. Um, and chronologically, I think we're made, let's get to college. Sure. Did, uh, so I assume you graduated from university. So I went to college in, uh, I wanted to be far enough from my family, but close enough that if I needed anything, I could be there. So, so I went just outside of Toronto to a, a University of Guelph. I actually looked at three schools. And the reason I went to Guelph was they did a, a program that was balanced between science and arts. And it was called academia. I don't uh -huh. even know if they still do it. So again, my whole thing was how do I take, do something that's different that a lot of other people wouldn't have had access to. So they were picking students who had, who were kind of top of the class to be part of this incubator program. Yes. Yeah. So we did arts and science. Now it was funny because you come out of it and you were like, okay, well, what am I doing? Arts or science? Yeah. But I still had access to professors and courses that, um, you know, not every student had. And it was a unique program. And I met a lot of really amazing people through that program as well. It reminds me, when I hear arts and science, it reminds me of, a, like, have you heard of the MIT Media Lab? Yes. So, and that's a corporate funded thing, actually, even though it's part of oh. the MIT. Yeah. Um, they, they do crazy stuff, which is expensive. Um, real blue sky, 20 years, 30 years out kind of stuff. Um, and, but, but, but that model exists in, in many other universities. NYU has um, its ITP program, which is an arts science, science kind of thing. And now we're finding out that the fantastic University of Guelph uh, yeah. has, um, or at least had and probably maybe still has, I should look a, at that. Um, a very interesting, you know, I, I, I honestly wish I had a program like this in college. I didn't, you know, find it or knew that it, ex it probably didn't exist, you know, where I went to school. So yeah. I think it's a super cool incubator, as you say, um, where the institution says it's OK to mix topics however you want. Yeah. Well, I was fortunate because the topics, too, were things like neuroscience. So. You know, there's an element of art, but there's an element of science because you're actually looking at brain functioning and learning and like the cognitive psychology aspect of it. And then there were standard courses you had to take with other students, but there were a lot of courses that we had that were this mix that allowed you to say that it's okay to mix arts and science and you don't have to decide yet on what curriculum you want to or what major you wanted to um, major in. So what I'm curious about, what is the most interesting thing or thing that you're the most passionate about that you did in university? So I ended up studying psychology yeah. and I at that point I had been interested in business. I was looking at nutrition and psychology as well. The reason I studied psychology, I didn't mention something that helped me with my risk taking behavior was when you deal with loss of a sibling, you actually say to yourself like, am I living the best life every day? And it's tough. Like you're always like, Am I doing everything that I could be doing? Am I like living the life that I say I want to lead? Am I teaching other people the things I'd, I'd like to have been learning? Am I learning everything I want to learn? So I, I at an early age, figured that out. And uh, I ended up staying in psychology. Now, I thought I was going, at this point, interesting, I thought I was going to go into psychology yeah. and not move into business. One of my professors, when I was saying I was interested in studying for my MBA, well, actually, a master's in psychology, said an MBA would be better from a long-term standpoint. Uh-huh. So I had studied for the GRE, wrote it actually in the U.S., in Buffalo, and then switched to write my GMAT and apply to MBA school, which and was in Toronto, the Shield School of Business. And is that's, that, that's a, I would assume, a great school. Yeah, it is one of the top... Um, schools and the top it is the number one top global school in Canada and um, I actually have advisors for my startup so Chris Carter is my advisor and then uh, Dean Horvath has been a huge supporter of myself and so has uh, Sean Siddick so I have a really good network there as well and so all my MBA friends here's what I want to know um, yeah typically and if you're going to do an MBA they typically say 
you should have some business experience before you do the MBA. Did, or did you just hop right into an MBA? Well, I actually um, was working full time and I did my MBA while I was working full right. time. And, at, and you've just said yeah. you've been working since you were yeah. 11. And so you had a lot of business experience already. Yes. You had a very entrepreneurial paper route, um, which, I, which I, is my favorite. Yeah. Um, and I was working at PepsiCo when I started and applied to the MBA and I moved to Kraft Foods. So wait, you were working the whole time through throughout university? Yeah, I worked um, many jobs, but I worked at uh, I worked at Foot Locker. Yeah, I worked at this place called um, Karuba Street. It was a, uh, a clothing store. They were all part of the same chain. Uh huh. Um, and so Foot Locker, Aldo, all of those were part of the same chain. So I was doing retail part time. I was also started to waitress because you were making more money on the tips. Yeah. And so I always went to school and worked at the same time. And I pretty much done that my whole life because I later on went to Harvard Business School as well. And I was working and going to school. So, you, so okay, so. So I know I jumped ahead. The, but, but, <laughs> Sorry, but, Hunter. <laughs> but um, still super interesting that. It's funny because I'm actually in a Cornell course for entrepreneurs right now. Uh -huh. Tori Birch uh, created something called the Fellows Program. It's a six week program and it's amazing. I'm midway through it right now and it's for female entrepreneurs. Yes. If you submit your business plan into her fellows program, she selects 50 um, students. If you don't get selected for the 50 students under that fellows program, you potentially could get the Cornell course and Bank of America, Cornell and Tori Birch put the course together. So before I met you today, I was actually working on some things on my mission, values, um, vision and culture. Wow. So it's like things you have to submit and you have, it's all online. I, I want to get into the future. Yeah, I know I jumped, sorry. It's okay. <laughs> I'm going to keep reeling you back in. Um, so you start uh, business school in Canada. Um, and did you do two years there? So I did, it was a three year uh, business school part time. I was on, also part of the Graduate Business Council. So that's how I had access to the dean as well as like some leaders within uh, the MBA program. So who are still like really good friends of mine now. And I was working at, um, just as I was finishing my MBA, I actually moved to GlaxoSmithKline. So I finished school, went from food, because I wanted to move away from kind of fast food and sugary foods. And then I went into more science-based products with GSK and GSK moved me to the US. Now, where did they move you? I moved to Pittsburgh. That was my global assignment. Wow. Um, Pittsburgh, a real, you really think of steel when you think of Pittsburgh. Yeah, it's a steel town, definitely. But, but any steel town needs to reinvent itself. You can't just be a one trick pony um, to call a town a pony. And um, so here you are working for a big chemical corporation. Yeah. Pharma, um, big pharma, yeah. I was three, I was thinking, I was like, I started in 2006 at GSK and I moved in 2012 to Pittsburgh. Yeah. And I was the senior brand manager running the biggest business um, in Canada, which was the Sensodyne brand. What, no, the teeth. Yeah, sensitive teeth. Uh, t yes, the sensitive tooth, toothpaste. Toothpaste. It's a global brand, it's like one of the number one. Uh, well, it is the number one sensitivity toothpaste, but it's a, a number one global brand from a marketing standpoint. So there was a ton of learning on that business um, and having worked on that in the US, or sorry, Canada for a few years, I was then moved to oral care in the US. So GSK is an American company? GSK is a UK based, ah. British based. So moved to the US headquarters. Uh, and, and that's in Pittsburgh? Pittsburgh, and then we also had an office in uh, New Jersey, in Parsippany. Yep. But I was I selected Pittsburgh. So you're out of an MBA when you started working for, or you're sort of in the middle transitioning. Done. Finished my MBA now part time and moved to a new uh, role because I, you know, after the MBA I was like, okay, I'm ready for a bigger challenge, and yep. moved from Kraft Foods at the time to GlaxoSmithKline. Got it. So to run my own, be a brand manager, I started at so, on Tums. So talk about, you know, when, when you're starting at, at, at this giant corporation, um, 
I, I've never worked for a big corporation. Oh, no. Ever. Okay, yeah. Uh, yeah. So it's talk, different. talk about corporate life, like, you know, thousands of employees navigating that. There's politics. Um, but you're also dealing with really big brands uh, and, and, and lots of customers. It just talk about that. Yeah. Like, you're, you're, you starting um, with, with already what I can tell is a lot of grit and determination and, and success already just by graduating business school while having to work a job. So yeah. how, how was it entering the corporate world? So because I had started and I, I did skip over one job that got me out into corporate and that was right out of college, I went to Frito-Lay and drove a truck. Uh -huh. So the 24 foot trucks with the chips on the side. Okay. So with that, that's how I entered into marketing. Um, so, and Frito-Lay was always known as an entrepreneurial company. So packaging design, think about flavor design and portfolio, um, and then the innovation around the product. So for me, it was easy because an entrepreneurial company like Frito-Lay and PepsiCo was a good fit. Um, the only thing was when, as I was starting to kind of grow, I was looking at where else would it make sense for me to get true marketing academic expertise because when I was in my early 20s the thinking was training and development was like the most important thing yeah and how could I get the best marketing training possible and so the companies you think about when you think about the best marketing it are companies such as Procter & Gamble Kraft Foods right those are all the things that like it's the big tier one sensodyne yes and you know consumer packaged goods companies that would like have really good spend on training and development but also global opportunities to move you around so that's really in the back of my head what I was looking at when I was at that age uh-huh and and it played out really well because you do a ton of training and development in marketing and sales and negotiations um, just the fundamentals that help you later on as an entrepreneur mm. and which also give me the confidence of you know I know how to build businesses based on looking at data I have a track record of having done it on big big businesses so, so talk, when you say build a business talk about that um, in, in chronologically you know while you're in the corporate world like yeah. are you starting a new sub brand or yeah so one of the things we had to do was look for new flavors. It's kind of funny, but at Frito-Lay, we'd all sit around in a table and say, okay, well, what would be the next biggest flavor of yes. potato chips? Now, would they, they, do they make the Doritos? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Now we're, okay. I mean, that's And we worked is, on tons of cool programs. Yeah. Right, that people really wanted to work on and also people really wanted to participate in. So we had a lot of things like, I worked on this program called Frito's Fandemonium. Okay. Which was, Across Canada, we wanted to find the biggest fan. So the biggest fan was someone that was gonna be like wild at that game, supporting to their team. And we were handing out Fritos at every CFL, Canadian football team, you know, game. And so for me, building a business was around how do you build the brand equity? And we started there with a lot of the times in the 90s, mid 90s, I guess. And this is when we first built out our first websites as well. Uh huh. So Tums.ca was the first website. Tums. Tums. Oh yeah. That I worked on. Yeah. Where SEO was at its infancy. Sure. Uh, Google, Google Analytics. You couldn't was even just, you couldn't even buy a Google AdWord at that point. Yeah. So this is like the beginning of all of this, and um, the consumer promotions were really big because it was around how do you win your consumers over in a way that drives your brand equity. And it was all about market share and looking at that sort of data. Um, and this whole concept of social media uh, wasn't even I, available. But, but there was still socializing and there was still media. They just hadn't combined yet. Yeah, well, the, the, at that time, people weren't spending on digital. Yeah. Now, I mean, a company will spend all their money on digital. Back then, it was still like, oh, do you put like 1% or 2% behind digital? I mean, that's a risk. So what I want to know is were you successful or or if not what learnings did you get from trying to launch this fandom 
what was it? Fan oh, the Freedom's Phantom Movement. Yeah. So, I mean, from a fan standpoint, it was a great program to build equity behind the brand. We moved, you know, when I moved companies and worked on um, brands like, and don't laugh at this, I don't even think it's around anymore, but Shake and Bake. Shake and Bake. I mean, it might be still around, but um, that, that was one of the brands that I worked on as well as in Canada, there's Kraft Peanut Butter and then the Salad Dressings. And the projects that Kraft was working on at the time were how do you harmonize? So it was a lot of data and analytics. Um, you know, how do you take a formula that's in one market and in North America streamline it? So you were looking at driving efficiencies. We were also looking at sustainability. How do we take the crackers, crumbs from the cracker manufacturing site and reuse them in the shake and bake? So it was like innovative ways of being more sustainable. Um, and then from a market share and overall brand messaging, you know, you were constantly creating new ads. It was all TV advertising at the time, pretty much. I mean, yeah. we were just starting to use digital. Um, and it was these equity messages. It was all about what's that message that's going to resonate with consumers, that's going to increase their brand awareness, and then drive your market share. Now, let's, uh, let me get, get abstract and theoretical. Sure. You have this company like Frito-Lay or, or GlaxoSmithKline or Procter & Gamble. And these companies have been around for 200 years, some of them, you know, with these very established chemical products and, and food items and, 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 and things that are, they're, they're making a lot of money. Um, they have a lot of time to survive as a company because when you're that big um, and have that much market share, it's your game to lose. Yes. And, You're the number one player. Right. Mm -hmm. so, but most, I think most people don't understand that these companies are trying, are, are tr some of them, or most of them, are trying to stay on top. Yes. Um, and you have to be entrepreneurial. Uh, you know, you can do, like, the old stuff that worked, mm -hmm. right? Just sell your plain old original Doritos. But you maybe have to do new flavors you, or totally new things. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I just find it fascinating, you know, that gigantic corporations, whether they like it or not, must be entrepreneurial. Yeah, well, I, I had some funny things that I worked on that didn't work. Mm. No, so I, actually, <laughs> I have some, yeah. That's what I like is the, yeah. is the learning sure. is, what, is what we're looking for. Uh, um, risk taking I, is like one of the biggest things that corporations did do a lot of risk taking. One of the things we'd done um, with social media, there you might remember um, a product called Sensodyne Isoactive. It was actually toothpaste in a can. It's kind of far ahead of its time. Mm. Also, if you think about a can, maybe not the best sustainable item to have long term for recycling purposes. Um, and then just the consumer behavior, right? Sensodyne is an older uh, tar demographic sure. and a target market for a brand. And when your teeth when your teeth hurt, you need. Um yeah, and you're Sensodyne. usually older when it's happening. And so creating an innovative format, uh -huh. we were trying to go after and attract younger users. And we did, um, and it's probably still on YouTube somewhere, Hunter. We did this 3D imaging uh, for the first time on Union Station in Toronto. And it was this visual that was projected onto Union Station to create a whole social media kind of, the first time I did this whole like 360 social media program. And you know, we were, we didn't have Instagram at the time, but it was Facebook. So we we're posting it on Facebook. We we're sharing all the um, insights. We we're giving real time live information about what was going on. Cause all around this Toronto art installation that happens in the city. Okay. So it was part of the art installations. So, and, I mean, the learning for me was we had tried something really innovative, but it didn't necessarily increase the brand equity to the level that we wanted it to. Right. So you invested a lot of resources. A lot of resources and money. And we were testing. I mean, it wasn't as if all the money was on that. We still had TV advertising and such to grow the brand, but we were really taking kind of a risk on let's test this out and see if it will work and build a big followership and a big amount of consumers to actually try the brand. What I would like to know is, you know, you've you've clearly had a deep corporate experience, worked yeah. for a lot of different brands, gotten a lot of experience. So why 
why not just become a vice president or bigger yeah. at a corporate, make a very cushy salary, um, not have to worry as much. You know, yeah. why, why not just do that? Yeah, so, um, so here's the funny thing I did. So I became the VP on the Walmart account um, at uh, another company, and then I was heading up all of sales strategy at RB4, the healthcare Mucinex brand. And um, what happened, pivotal point, I had looked at programs at Ivy League schools for executive education as part of my career development in corporate. I selected the Harvard Business School General Management Executive Program, so I was in the GMP20 cohort. And when you go through the program, it's kind of a point where, first thing I always remember is that the context with HBS is, it's leaders that make a difference in the world. Mm -hmm. And when I went through the program, I realized that if I stayed in my corporate job, I wasn't going to feel like I really made the difference that I wanted to make. Okay. And it was kind of an inner passion and burning I'd always had. And yeah. I was also faced with every time I looked at leaders at that point, which was five years ago, how many CEOs were women? Yes. And how many glass ceilings were Pretty much were Carly really... Fiorina, and that was it. Exactly. You, you remember. <laughs> that was it. And how many women were really breaking glass ceilings? And at that time, I was kind of frustrated because... I'm also Canadian, so I'm a little bit of a fish out of water in the U.S. market in kind of the, the U.S. context of corporate. But we have Martin Short. We have, um, <laughs> we have you know, so many, Dan Aykroyd, yeah. so many established Canadians. Um, and, and I'm sure there's heroes in the business world too, but you're saying you feel like a fish out of water. Yeah, well, just from the standpoint of in corporate, yeah. Canadians always get the reputation that we're too nice right. or that we're nice. Right. And for some odd reason, there's this thinking that in business, you can't be you can't have like these amazing values and drive growth on your business. And that was another thing that was frustrating. I mean, I'll say that out of all the corporations I worked on, the one um, company that definitely resonated, especially when I had worked on some serious uh, consumer complaints and issues was and even just trials and tribulations of just regular corporate life. Um, was GSK because the values like it's do more, feel better, live longer. I still remember it. Uh -huh. And uh, and it really resonates within the company. And when I moved to other companies and corporations, yeah. the values were not ingrained in the company. Mm. And that really, like for me, meant a lot because I grew up in a really, I grew up in a big family, really values based. I started to really look at my values and really dig into, okay, what, from a company standpoint, what do I want my company to stand for? And we're really around like Watch out for this. integrity. Oh, yeah, yeah, thanks. Um, There's poop on every episode. Yeah. <laughs> we're not in Paris, though. That's the worst city uh, for it because nobody picks it up. Yeah. Yeah. I've stepped in it before there. It's disgusting. So, so my, my, my <laughs> outtakes from Paris are going to be phenomenal. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Just dodge everything and have yeah, as, eyes in the back of your head. So um, the just kind of getting back to like why I did it was I was at the point where I was, you know what, I've achieved like a really successful career in, and a good and great financial success. I had owned, I bought four properties over that period. And I was now looking at another property and I was thinking, okay, well, like really what do I want to do for the next five to 10 years? Uh huh. And I realized at this, that point through HBS and through sort of my corporate last three or four years that I was. I should start my own business, that I could do it yeah. and that I had enough experience and enough um, mental resilience and persistence. I'd traveled countries, I'd you know, gone all over the world um, and I'd done a lot of this by myself, right? So I'd been in, I've been in the US for eight years and I was like, I'm ready. Yeah. Yeah, You're, I'm ready. So you had crystallized, it, yes. it's like you feel financially secure enough to start a business. Yeah. Um, experience wise, you feel like you've seen a lot and that maybe things are starting, you're starting to see maybe patterns repeat themselves and, and 
you're starting to say, oh, I think I understand how that, this works. Yeah. So I want to know, what's the inception of Bruasis? Was that the yeah. first thing that you tried? So, no. Um, and actually, I didn't tell you, I did try doing a kind of com a few companies in Canada while I was in MBA school. Uh -huh. uh, they just didn't materialize because I was still at school and I was working a corporate job and I hadn't really understood what it was like to be an entrepreneur at that point. So, but you're starting to understand. Yeah. And and what happened, and yeah, I'd started by actually building business plans and understanding like the premise of what, and it, not that I'd say you need a business plan anymore, because you don't, but at that time, you know, 10, 15 years ago, when you were looking at it, you did. So the idea was, I knew when I moved to the New York area that I wanted to work for myself. So I had to start ideating on what that was. Uh huh. So I had looked into the spaces that I worked in, so healthcare, um, and then spaces that needed solutions. So I was looking a lot at, you know, um, development, like things where I thought there were issues. So one of my big um, bees in my bonnet still is, is um, around 360 feedback for people in corporations, because I didn't feel like you should only have two times in the year that you're talking about development. Like uh -huh. you should be constantly talking about development and constantly talking about evolution. And it goes back to millennials, I think, just what do you what they want in a, li a corporate life now? It's yeah. a balance. It's more around a lifestyle. I um, want to work a corporate job if I ever have to, which I don't intend to, that will not fire me for taking a lunch for doing an episode like this. Exactly. And if you wanted to say to somebody, if you wanted to say to somebody, I don't feel like I want to come into work today, but I do want to do something for the company. And actually, I want to go out and do you know, I want to travel to another country and go out and like look at all the innovation they have. Um, a lot of times corporations didn't really give you that opportunity. I think they're doing it more and they have more open, open space and open culture, but it was just unheard of, right? So um, I started to look at industries that had, so I used to analyze a lot of industries in my corporate job. That was like, you'd quickly look at it, you'd be looking at P&Ls, you'd be looking at industry financials, and I looked at um, the craft alcohol space uh -huh. and then started to dissect it. And in particular, five years ago, craft beer was growing at 13%. Yeah. So you saw a signal in the data. Yes. So that's where I said, and the P&Ls for craft beer made sense from a product standpoint because of the margins. So I was looking at everything on the P&L, and that was when I said, you know what, this industry hasn't used a ton of data. They're using distributor data. There's not a ton for craft brewers when it comes to IRI, Nielsen, the big top data companies. Whoops. So I know, that was my fault. Both my fault too. Yeah, I just kept going. So that's where I said, this is like the area that um, I could help businesses and the whole mission of like, giving data, like an access for all to data. So craft beer was your entry point. Yes. Uh, talk about the first steps you took uh, uh, along the journey to Brewasis. Yeah, so we started another company actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and we What were, was that called? It was called Brewtopia Experience. And, and let's, let's dissect it, let's. Yeah, a lot uh, of learning there, two years ago. So uh, was, what'd you do? Yeah, so the concept was, um, Hardware, because uh. think about my dad and his background. I was like, I was super comfortable with hardware. Um, they're self-serving, self-pouring taps. Yes. So you'd scan a bracelet, you'd you'd pour your beer, and then you'd measure the ounces. You'd pay for your ounces, so pay per pour. You would get that information on a handheld app device. So did you build this automatic automatic pouring machine? We actually did. <laughs> You we did. actually did. Cool. Yeah, we did. And it's in my basement now in the I, graveyard. I think it's the like basement. yeah, super innovative, super future thinking like we still don't have automated. We still have bartenders. Yes. They still exist. There's some competitors out there, but our concept was around give the breweries data. They'd have a competitive set and understand how their beer is performing versus others and get consumer insights. So I think that's already super forward thinking because you're you're in trying to create a hardware thing, not just as a means, you know, selling it as a, and in and of itself, but also to gather data as a second play. Yes. And so the whole concept was if you could provide this data to the breweries and also back to the consumer. So my other thing was 
you might go out under and not know how much you've had to drink or what you drank uh -huh. because after you've had a, f a couple, you're not really paying attention. But if you had better information in terms of what you had and potentially you're not feeling great the next day, right? But if you saw a trend in what you were drinking, you might switch up some of your behavior. Uh huh. So the concept, and not everyone liked this idea because some people don't want to know what they're drinking. Right. So, which was fine. But I did know that there would be a subset of people that potentially would want to know how, what am I drinking? And I know I'm very sensitive, so I like to know if it was a specific wine and I was not feeling great the next day, what was it in that wine? And I tell you, you never go back and say, hey, where was that bottle I had at that restaurant? But if you could track it at the time or at the event and then it became more widespread, then you'd have this data that you had on an ongoing basis. So this sounds like a thesis to me. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, visionary as well, I'm gonna go way past this now, was you could also help people who are potentially had issues um, and on the, it's great. Um, <laughs> so that was the, the idea was then, you know, how else could you use that information and that data from a consumer standpoint? So not only back to the brewery, but back to you as the consumer. Um, the issue with that, and um, as I was going through with accelerators in, and I was talking to some um, of the accelerators in Cincinnati, so Uptac, um, I was also talking to Oceans, and um, one of the generator, which is another one. Uh -huh. And the whole idea was that hardware, way too expensive, I threw events to test out the, the data yeah. and collection of data. And it was like throwing a mini wedding in New York. As far as price. Price and logistics and weather came into play. And as New you, Yorkers are finicky when they want to go out. And yeah. so we're collecting data at the event. And you know, also you're running into hardware issues with handling beer. So beer is really finicky going through cables and pipes and stuff. And so you've got foamy beer coming out when you're testing out um, this hardware. And so it was time to pivot. Ah. Yeah. So uh, immediately, or not immediately, but after some time you realized uh, what you're trying to do is maybe too future thinking. Um, it's gonna too expensive. be very expensive. Yeah, to scale. And um, so what, what did you pivot to? Yeah, so then it was, all right, well, if the idea and this, the, the problem I'm trying to solve was giving the industry and industries that don't have readily access to data or they don't know how to use their data and, and match it to other information to be able to provide better insights. It's still this concept of blind spots in your business and that if you took information that you had, you would make better decisions. Okay. So um, said, how else can I deliver that? And that's where I came up with the whole concept of Brewasis and software as a service. So what was your initial thesis? So the concept was if we um, provided information that businesses would make better business decisions. It's just super like, I, I feel that. It's, yeah. a, it's like big overarching. And like, what did you try? Yeah, so we started out with um, selling the idea of if we took information from a variety of methods, so websites, um, your, your information internally, like a whole bunch of things, let's play around with it. Um, it's now, and play around with it I meant, let's look for correlations that would indicate that they would drive sales. Okay. Okay, so the number one thing for craft alcohol player is how are you gonna drive more sales and what things would do that um, when you're an entrepreneur yourself and you have too many things that you need to focus on. And you're trying to, you're so trying to- Simplify it. So you're trying to get some strategic business improving, maybe even business saving information to a craft brewer. Um, and this stuff, it sounds like magic. So how do you like, do yeah. mag How so, do you do your magic? So we've been, um, so we started, we pivoted last year. So August, um, created the new brand, uh, and then Brew launched, Ace, Brew Oasis, Ace. launched a new site. At the time we knew we wanted a parent company as well that didn't just provide alcohol industry, but also other industries such as CBD and cannabis. So you're already thinking like- Future. We have to be diversified. Yeah, what um, other business verticals um, 
would we look at? Uh. Okay, so, but at the time we needed to go and you need to test, you need to build a prototype. So we started working on a prototype and we created the prototype, um, which was it provided them with their social media information, insights based on what they saw on their social media, so versus their competitors. And it's the first time that we're taking social media and they were seeing their market share versus competitors. Mm -hmm. So you're not going to take every competitor, right? Because that would be so much data. Yeah. But we ended up saying, let's look at your top five. So you and four other cust uh, customers or competitors. And let's start to take a look at what everyone's doing and what's working in the industry. And then also what's not working and make recommendations. So that's what we went and started working on last year in, um, in the fall. So how did that go? So we, I did a little pivot to, I want to add this one. Um, at Let's the same on. time when we were doing that, companies were asking us to do customized programs. So we did a massive project with Palantir. Yes. Um, it was a, five, a four country, five city. Okay. Um, so we did it in Australia, Sydney, Australia, London, England. Uh, we did it in the US, so three countries, sorry. And then it, the concept, was in three cities, in, so it was DC, New York, and California. And they wanted a customized can for their business. They were doing a hackathon. Okay. Okay, so I know this is a little astray, but this was, the concept was, how do we help craft breweries drive sales? Okay, great. If we used their, um, the breweries that aren't necessarily producing at their maximum capacity, uh -huh. so their excess capacity, and also we're providing them data and insights based on what consumers were saying about their beer, then they could help improve it. Sure. So um, the thing was, there's some players already, plus it's not a big enough industry. Not enough people really want to have a customized beer for their corporate events. And alcohol is really difficult to play around with when it comes to certain events. Okay. Because you need to make sure everyone's of age. Uh. And, you need, and most people are using big beer companies or big com alcohol companies to provide alcohol on site because they already have contracts. Okay, so you're, you're already painting a landscape of like... Barriers. How, how, barriers, how yeah. it's going to be difficult. So then we said, okay, um, the, the best thing to do is to be able to really take a look at what are, they, what are craft breweries using and distilleries, cideries, and wineries using to make... Um, to educate their consumers and drive brand awareness. Yeah. And it came around social media. So and so social media was where I went to next with really digging into the data. And the con yeah. yeah, and the concept now is... Do you, do you know hedge funds use social media to um, make qu quantitatively, you know, affect their buying decisions? Totally. <laughs> I would, I, I'm amazed at how much data... I didn't realize hedge funds, but I One know... One of the guys on this show yeah. um, let me know about that. Okay. Like the amount of information that people, so one of the things I had found out was um, some of the craft breweries are using, they're following other craft breweries on social media to then be able to find out what their competitors are doing and where they are, uh -huh. and then penetrating those markets as well. So basically, I shouldn't publish my show on social media. I should keep it totally locked down and distribute it via um, you know, video cards on the street. Yes. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so, just, I'm just yeah. setting you up. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> so it was just one of those things where um, we had said, okay, let's look at what, there's something called dark data. So this is where I got into where I am now. What's uh, now? So dark what, data. Okay. What's that? What's that? And I love this. So, cause I was all about my, if you go all the way back to Nancy Drew, I'm all about yeah. like, look at information. No one's going to look at. I would go back into the tables of research reports and find stuff that would be big enough pieces of information to drive a business. Okay. Or I look for untapped areas in the year where you're not driving your business and could be um, driving it even further, right? I'm gonna give you some examples so you yes, get an please. idea. Okay. Yes, please. All right, so um, first one is, if you're gonna figure out stuff about consumers, the data tables behind the research, somebody's gonna give you a research report, but the data tables or have everything and people don't look at those because mm. it's just too much information as a brand manager. But those are the areas where you'd ask questions and dig deeper into your consumer and figure out what is it that's driving their behavior to be able to change a brand. And we did that for Tums when we were building a strategy. So, but you're talking big businesses. Now, are you targeting big businesses at I'm Bruises? not, but I'm using the same concept in for small businesses. So that's why I'm gonna explain it. Okay. So, 
Um, when you're in cough cold season, right? It's a season. The whole idea was how do you grow outside of the season? So we were looking at, are there things with allergies or summer colds that would help drive growth for the business? And the marketing team then ended up putting an advertisement on air that promoted and talked about this outside of season um, concept. And so that's what I mean by when you look at data, you're looking at areas where there's untapped growth or you're not using the data to drive growth. And that's the concept of dark data. So it's non-traditional data. Okay, so nothing data. to do with the dark web. Not dark web. Got it. It's types of data that aren't being used for a specific purpose. So it's hidden yeah. almost, like blind spot. And that's what a lot of the stuff I do now is around, you wouldn't necessarily think to use it. Um, so it's non-traditional data, or it's data that's being served for one purpose but hasn't been correlated to other information, or it's just like used in a different way or not even used and just stored somewhere, and it's just left there. Give me an example of one, now, you have customers. Yes. Give me an example of one customer uh, as to how they, like Please. what what insights did you provide them like you're saying? Yeah, so one of the things we did in order to look at, you know, selling equipment. Yeah. You would normally think, okay. These, the, can I the just Brooklyn do a, here, right? Yeah, can I just do a little turn? Yeah. Um, and it's so bright out. There it is. These guys, there's my finger. These guys have a lot of equipment, as you were just talking about. Yeah. And they are one of the biggest breweries in Brooklyn, if not the biggest. Started um, by Mr. Ottaway himself. So what I was saying was um, you would, traditionally you would just like post out to your group or your brewery group or use some brewery websites. But we actually did targeted ads. So Google ads, Facebook ads, Instagram ads, in, and geo-targeted because you're not going to buy equipment from another location quite far away or you're not going to look at um, you know, potentially doing cross production at a brewery who's really far out of your district. So in the Northeast, do you want to find somebody else in the Northeast? Uh -huh. So we looked at states that would be great contract states. If you're starting out, instead of having your own brewery, right. here's what we'd recommend, or here are the breweries we'd recommend you should work with I to do contract brewing. I'm actually chasing down the Talea beer company female okay. owned beer oh, great. here in the city yeah and uh, they're already on the new york times so maybe too big for this show um but i don't believe that anybody's too big for this show okay. yeah but i'm chasing down a number of craft breweries because i think it's a fascinating topic yeah um, it's just like things even in the cannabis and cbd space well, it's so, a very interesting space yeah so another one i is actually just, have uh, a lot of buying that i'm gonna do as far as stocks like canopy growth yeah oh yeah that I'm, but but more diversified um and i've been actually meaning to pull the trigger on that for about four years wow. and it's all complicated because i think there's a recession coming mm -hmm. um so i'm at that place between being bullish on cbd and cannabis yeah but also being bearish at the moment on the market as a whole okay so I'm sort of in, but that's sort of why I have Because you want to wait until it dips lower. Is that what? So, I, 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 yes. I, the, like the other concept is that um, a lot of craft breweries don't have the time to look at what has happened in their social media and what's done the best in terms of their performance versus also looking at the competitors. So we do a deep dive into the whole space for a full year by quarter and then by month to understand what are the things that are big themes and trends. Mm -hmm. And that's where you get, once you've looked at numerous uh, breweries where you see the big insights come out, right? So, you know, around holiday themes and gift packs. And I mean, the traditional things you're gonna see are like the Father's Day, but what you're looking at are ingredients that are coming up. What's the next thing that should be popping up for um, flavors that you should be looking at? Yeah. So there's all these insights that come out when you're like digging through mounds of information and data. And then you're, you're applying this, this data to small companies to help them get very important business saving, surviving information yeah. and, and strategy. Growth, growth driving. So what do you think is your biggest success to date 
Is it was it helping them find the equipment, or do you have another success story? Yeah, um, I think the biggest one to date is actually working with some of the top, um, having some great advisors, first of all, who are from some of the top companies. Um, but in addition to that, it's having the trust from breweries, cideries, wineries, and cannabis companies who share their data with us. So their sales information, yes. tax sizes, et cetera, because yes. then we layer it on to other information so to you be able have, to find correlations. You, so you that's a huge testament to the values of my company because you wouldn't be doing that if you didn't believe in, you know, looking for growth strategies, but also in trusting that, you know, we take everything that we do with the highest realm of integrity. So you have strategic advisors that are very well positioned to help you on your mission. Yeah. Um, and then also, and, and just like companies that are buying into it now who are recommending us to others. And then the access that I have on, I was telling you, I was just in Belgium for five days. Yes. Um, so I was looking at the beer scene there uh, as well as the other alcohol scene, but also at an event where they, um, which is Tomorrowland, which is one of the largest music festivals in the world. And it has been extremely successful. It started off really small. I think they said they started out in 2011 because um, it's their 15 year anniversary. Does that make sense from a math standpoint? Yeah. So they uh, started off really small and now they're creating this whole experience. And so I was looking at how can we you know, bring um, the craft beer concept slash cannabis CBD um, to that, but Belgium and France are the two s countries that it's hosted in. Yeah, the, and those and are, they, when you think of... They well, don't, it's not legal, it's not legalized yet. But in like the CBD Netherlands, which is just a very quick hop over, it is. Yes. Um, and beer, I think of beer, Belgium, I think of... Uh, Germany, uh, France is obviously wine, but there's huge amounts. Do you think there's a risk in going uh, global as opposed to staying domestic? Well, um, it's more around how do you take the domestic opportunity and bring it global? Ah. So it's not about necessarily going global. And I, I, one thing I've always said is being um, Canadian and then having moved to the US and then just the amount of travel that I do, that it's so important to think bigger picture. Mm. Um, and also the amount of travel that everybody does nowadays. I mean, millennials don't even want to work from one location. They want to work from anywhere in the world. Sure. So. Uh, another question. Um, you've been at this, what, three, uh, an entrepreneur for, well, what, three, four years? Um, entrepreneur, I left my corporate job last year in May, so May 2018. So, for a number of reasons, investing in your own company could be wise. Are you bootstrapping? Have you taken on investment? Yeah, so that's you're 100% a hundred percent solo. I am and a solo founder and I'm running tech as well, which is very difficult because it's not my, I mean, I have a tech background from a configuration and hardware. Uh, and what I'm doing now is I actually put a pitch deck together. So we're looking for investors. Sure. Yeah. So we're looking to raise 500,000 um, and in a convertible note. Now and these days, I, th I strongly believe the tech sector is going to be the bubble that pops. Yeah. Because a, seri a seed round today in 2019, 1.5 to 2 million for a seed round. Yeah. You're this is pre-seed. You're, you're 500, uh, right. Yeah. And then we have this new term, which is pre-seed. Yeah, yeah, um, it's pre-seed. <laughs> so we have a term, I think the term pre-seed will no longer exist in 2021, um, or it will be, you know, very small, smaller, uh, because you, just to give some context, you know, in 2011, I worked for a company that did a seed round of $250,000. Okay. Yeah. Wow. S yeah. Those are no, they're no longer the days of seed. And then the series, and then, and then it got to 1 million and the series A was 5.1. Okay. Um, but but now like a, a series A is 5.1 million. So I, th I strongly believe it's a bubble. Yeah. Well, it's, it's a, a totally different game nowadays. I mean, it's, there's a lot of money to be invested in tech, but to your point, it's, there's a lot of companies out there, a lot of startups now. So. 
So what are you going to do about it? So you're, yeah. raising, you're raising money. So I, and I read this, but I was recommended to read a book on um, understanding uh, investment. And so I had, I've been working with the angel community here, uh, my advisors, and I actually have some angels that I'm restructuring our pitch deck for. So like any founder, you're working on a multiple things and you're supposed to only work on funding when you're working on it. And I don't know how any other founder does that, but if anyone has as opposed any tips, to actually, as opposed to actually running the business, running the business. Yeah. So what I, I, I've interviewed 26 founders over the last, yeah. and uh, what have they said? <laughs> I'll tell you what they said. Um, I'll quote Rachel who runs a, runs Wethos and she pitched, she was in full-time pitch mode for nine months. She pitched 200 wow. investors. Her company is, she builds digital agencies. Okay. But it's, it's, she isn't just an agency, she's a platform. Wethos is a platform. Um, so, she pitched 200 people, got 199 no's. She finally got that one, uh, yes. And that one yes is a really serious investor named right. Charlie O'Donnell okay. of Brooklyn Bridge Ventures. And then he became the lead investor and the round just sort of took place. That's what I've heard it is. And I haven't even formally pitched to anyone yet, which is not, I, as of as looking for funding, I need to get in full on pitch mode, but I have heard So you're heard just begin you're just beginning. I'm just starting. I just finished my pitch deck a month ago and then I'm reframing it for this um, angel team that I'm pitching to. And I've just been getting advice from investors in New York, just in terms of like their perspective and Amazon uh, Web Services in Soho. So there's the loft space. Yes. Um, is where we were, our team works out of. Fantastic. Um, I have an amazing intern team from TechWorks at Queensboro and Kingsboro. So CUNY TechWorks yeah. um, provides me with coders and UX design team. And you don't mind talking about that? No. These aren't and in fact, if anyone, if anyone wants interns as well, uh, they should reach out to me. There you go. Um, yeah, because they're at Sharon.Joseph at Bruasis.com. They can uh -huh. get your info, my and info from and, you. And hopefully with a nice, um, ex fr from a very great proven, proven uh, from a venture capitalist with an amazing provenance, maybe even a female venture capitalist. Oh, yeah. Um, and could, could also reach you. Yes, yes, I would, I would love that. So we're now in uh, full development of our beta. So we're in a alpha test right now, and I'd like to have 30 customers by the end of the year. Now, what is, your, what is your business model? Are you like a monthly model, or are you still figuring it out? Monthly subscription model. And uh, so what, what price point are we talking 200, about? 200, 400. And then there's a one that's based on what uh, what things you want. And the standard is you're going to get uh, social media on five you versus four other competitors, um, sentiment. Um, you're going to understand like the keywords and stuff that are coming out. We look at four major areas, and we didn't talk through this in terms of data. So your social media data, which is your Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, um, and YouTube. We look at web analytics. Um, so search engine optimization and those sort of things, it's sort of a separate uh, part of our business model. We look at the sales data and then we layer it onto other pieces of information. Uh -huh. And then industry data. So those four areas are what we, and for the craft beer industry, it's a lot easier because we can access a lot of it through online, the internet, that sort of thing. Um, and then the other areas like cannabis, and CBD, that's kind of a new space that we're looking at, but it's been amazing as well because there's some really big, big data companies, but there's no one who's capturing the smaller brands and giving them information in terms of how to grow their businesses. And that's what I'm trying to do. So can, can any company today become a customer of Bruasis? For example, if I have a record store or even this, this theater here, yeah. could, could they become a, uh, get the insights and, well, and, and detective work from Brewasis, or do you have to be a beer and, and cannabis company today to, to qualify yeah, as a customer? We had investors ask us that, and so our focus is on the craft alcohol and kind of high growth areas. But 
even on a, a, a plane recently, someone asked me about the fashion industry. Yes. And so for sure, as part of our alpha test, easy enough for us to pull together um, you know, a testing platform for somebody who's in another industry. Yeah. It just has to fit within the context of extremely high growth. The, di the industry hasn't had available data. Like we wouldn't do consumer packaged goods. Why um, not? Who, who has big, meaning who has access to big data. Like mm. I wouldn't be going after the um, P&Gs of the world and stuff to do this kind of work, mm. right? This is, I'm not trying to be an agency for the large uh, consumer packaged goods companies, uh -huh. but if it was a small startup beverage company and they were trying to figure out what's their market share and understand the landscape. So we actually have a, another client who's a distillery that's a startup and they had no idea in terms of like, hey, what's the competitive landscape? So we did a whole review for them, a deep dive that we call, and then we also went in and said, we're giving them monthly analytics to be able to understand what's going on in the space now before they enter, and then what disruption do they create? Yes. So a great spot to be as a, a startup where you haven't even entered the space and you wanna see what's going on right now and then what happens when you enter. I love it. Yeah. So do you, th I have one final question as we are right here at the end. Um, but do you think we, uh, or two final questions. Sure. The first is, do you think we covered everything? Is there something I missed? Um, wow, we covered a lot. So we went through a lot of the history. I think the biggest thing for me now is that um, I should share, we created an umbrella parent company um, called Cruasis. Cruasis. And so our Instagram's Cruasis Data. We're just launching that. We're just launching our website in about a month. I'm headed to Colorado. That's going to cover off um, the CBD and the cannabis and the hemp yes. as part of our business. Yes. Um, so I'm spending a week out there and it's really excited. And we're looking actually for brands from an alpha test standpoint. For in hemp? Yeah, well. in a while. Yeah, so that'd be one. <laughs> Other thing too is I'm always looking for people to join our team. So I always love to uh, put a shout out to my amazing team and the teams I've had who have like helped build it to what it is today. And then I'm always looking for great people in sales and data um, and analytics. So I'll throw that out there as well. Yeah. Yeah. So final question now. Oh, the final question. This is the most important question I think of the show. Okay. Um, so we save the best for last. Yes. Um, Sharon. Yes. Hunter. How do you think you have grown as an entrepreneur? In what ways? Sure. So first thing is uh, values. So I have had to make some really tough decisions. I've had actually um, an individual who's going to build out my MVP and, um, and do it at no cost and literally was like, um, you know, had this expertise Hunter that yes. would have helped me probably move me super fast forward. Um, but our values weren't aligned. Mm -hmm. um, and so the values of my company, which are around diversity, curiosity, insight, solutions, integrity, if you do not align to my values or the values of our company or our team, that always trumps everything. And that's taught me a lot about d business decisions mm. and who I work with. Yeah. And so some people like it, some people don't, because they're like, actually, your only thing is around survival. And I'm like, I don't believe that. I mean, I'll survive. Trust me, I've survived this long yeah. under, and I'm, I'm still surviving. Yes. So um, that, that would be number one. Number two is just like the support from my family and friends, even when I think I'm crazy, has been tremendous. Mm. Um, and um, the resilience. I can't tell you how resilient I've become but I'm like super happy and um, you know, even though sometimes I think I'm crazy, most of the time I think I'm crazy and confident in my idea. Um, Cause you know, there's things like, I actually won't even, I won't bring it up cause it takes us on an entirely different direction, but there's a lot of entrepreneurs who have like this narcissism, like idea of where they're headed and it might be too visionary. So they're not actually getting stuff done. Right. So I always try to balance my vision and where I'm headed with the day to day and actually my interns and the team that I work with on a day to day basis really ground me. Yes. And I've really learned that the importance of a team and building a really strong uh, culture. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, and then meeting great people like you. Yes. Yeah. Well, thank you, Sharon, so much for coming on Startup Hunter. I think that you are uh, disciplining your data, I which we, it's a huge spin on like kind of being funny on you know, we're cracking the whip on your data. It might be like unruly and it's hiding out and you don't know where it is and we're gonna rally it all together.
you, you're, you're gonna rally data. You are definitely a data detective. Um, and this is where you come. You go to Brewasis if you're in the um, brewing industry or the cannabis industry uh, for now. And thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. Bye.